In this tutorial, we're going to be talking about the spiral line from Anatomy Trains. And we're going to focus on the postural function of it. We're going to look at the movement function of it. And then we're going to look at its anatomy and how it's uh, constructed. Because we can look at the whole body view and we can also sort of, not that we should, but we can sort of break it down into some parts because um, it can help us understand the whole system a little bit better. The spiral line, as you can see here on the diagram, runs from the base of the skull all the way down to the foot and essentially it runs all the way down and then all the way back up again. We'll talk about that um, a little bit more in a second. And not only does it run down the body and back up again, it also runs across the body and in some respects across the leg as it comes down and then uh, wraps under the foot and back up as well. So we've got, essentially we've got two crossings or three crossings um, of the body because you can see again as we come up the back here as well. So it's a uh, slightly more elaborate uh, line of the body as opposed to the, let's just say, uh, the superficial front line or the lateral line in so much as it changes, uh, or sorry, it crosses, it crosses the body. But postural function of it is it help maintains balance in all planes. So planes basically mean the body moving forwards and back, the body moving side to side, and also the body rotating one way and rotating the other way. So it works in all planes because it runs uh, across the body, down the body, up the body, so on and so forth. Uh, it connects the foot arch to the pelvis and helps the tracking of the knee. So when uh, in the past I've talked about knee injuries and looking at the hip, this is one of the reasons. So if you've got knee problems or a knee condition, this is one of the first places that I go, is I go up to the hip and I want to have a look and see what's going on up here because that will help guide why that pain is there um, because it's the hip that in a sense tracks um, or, or uh, helps the tracking of the knee which is mentioned here and then uh, aids in counterbalance during walking so as we swing this leg forward this side of the body needs to move as well so it acts as that counterbalance uh, that goes across the body so that's what it's it's doing with regards to its postural function the final one is uh, movement function. So we've kind of mentioned that one with the counterbalancing and during walking, but we've also got aids rotational movement for the very simple reason is it's connecting uh, the, uh, uh, the, ro the rotational muscles, let's say, that aid in, in rotational movements. And then the, the fascia or the spiral line enhances that and sort of, in a sense, brings it together to make it one whole movement. And then finally, it aids eccentric and isometric contractions during rotational movements to reduce folding and collapse. Now, what that means is if you've watched any of my uh, core training or core strength or even core stability uh, tutorials, I talk about maintaining the proper posture of the spine. Now, this is not only what the spine wants, it's not only what the muscles are doing, but it's also how the fascia is designed to work, if you will. So not only the the muscles are built to work that way, the spine and the joints of the of the spine are meant to work that way, but also the fascia aligns with it as well because we want to maintain that posture. We want to reduce the uh, the folding and the collapsing, and also rotational movements are heavily involved uh, in sporting activities. You know, you can literally list them off. Golf, boxing, tennis, football, rugby, American football, baseball, basketball, whatever it might be. There is some sort of rotational movement throughout all of those. And we want to maintain proper posture of the spine and move from the pelvis during those. So again, not only are the, is, is the skeletal system uh, aligning with that, the muscular system is, and on top of that, the fascial system is. Uh, as well. So again, it's another reason to further understand how the body works, which then uh, helps us understand how we then go about using our body. 
Now that we've learned a little bit about its function with regards to posture and movement, we're now going to delve a little bit into the anatomy of the spiral line. Now, as I've mentioned in previous um, tutorials on anatomy trains and fascial lines, this is just a very brief overview of what you'll find in Anatomy Trains, the book. Um, there's a lot more information within that. Uh, it talks about each line. It then starts again, like I'm kind of doing, uh, but in more detail overviewing it. And then it breaks down each section of the line and then talks about uh, movement exercise, movement therapy, manual therapy as well uh, within the book. So, um, if you want to learn more about this, and there's a lot more to learn about this, uh, please do go and buy the book, Anatomy Trains. So, we are now going to look at the anatomy of this spiral line. So, we're going to look at the stations and the tracks. If you've read the book or you've, um, you're reading the book, then you'll understand what that means. Basically, he makes the analogy of train stations and train tracks. So, you've got the red dots here, which would be the train stations, and then you've got the green tracks. Um, or the green lines which would be the, the train tracks that's the sort of metaphor that he uses uh, throughout the book to be able to, um, uh, to sort of, I don't know imagine these lines within the body with regards to it starting, the spiral line it starts and ends at the occipital ridge you can see point number 1 and point number 23 which are here and well, what should be over here if we're looking at one side and I'll explain that in a second um, again, I'm not going to go through where each of these are in detail. There are 23 of them, so it would just be a case of me reading out all the different fascial lines and bony landmarks that it's going through. For the purposes of this uh, tutorial, I'm not going to do that because I don't feel it necessary. With regards to where the line goes, you can see it comes off of number one, goes down across the back, then comes around the front where the serratus anterior is, then meets here on the ASIS. What it then does is goes down the sort of outside of the leg. As it gets to the knee, it then crosses the front of the shin and goes to the inside of the foot down here where the arch is. It then wraps under the arch and then comes up the outside of the leg, up through the hamstring, hits the uh, sort of the, the base of the pelvis, comes up to the sacrum and then goes across the back and up to what would be the final point. So you can see that it comes across the body at the front and it comes across the body at the back, but also it comes across the body uh, or certainly comes from lateral to medial on the, uh, on the back of the leg and from lateral to medial on the front of the leg. So essentially it's wrapping itself around uh, the body. So that's uh, sort of the the, uh, the lateral line in its entirety. If I then just put it on the other side, you can obviously see it comes down the side there, across, down the leg, wraps onto the inside of the foot, comes up the outside, across the hamstring, up the pelvis, across the back, and then up the erector spinae into point 23 again. So that is the, I guess, the overview of what the anatomy looks like. And you can see midway is base of first metatarsal and then how it wraps around the body. And obviously I've sort of mentioned that um, as I've gone along. So that is in some respects an overview of the anatomy. What we're now going to look at is something um, specific about uh, the ASIS, which is included in this line and other lines as well. So we'll go through to the next slide and talk about that. As I mentioned at the start of the tutorial, uh, we can break the spiral line up into, or we can divide it in half. Not that we should, because we are talking about um, sort of whole body movement, whole body therapy, or whole body rehabilitation, if you want to put it in that way, uh, put it in that sort of phrase. Um, but it can help us understand how the how the body is working with or when it comes to the ASIS um, because we can divide it into upper and lower now this is this is me putting my understanding on top of it so this isn't necessarily uh, Tom Meyer's opinion and it's not necessarily written in the book this is just helping or this has helped me understand it and how the 
and, and, and how the body works and how these fascial lines work. So we've got the upper spiral line, which is the occipital ridge to the ASIS. So that's the one where it comes off the back and then joins on to the ASIS at the front. And then you've got ASIS uh, to the first metatarsal. So then you've got sort of coming down and then going further down the body. So ASIS to first metatarsal, which goes under the, um, uh, under the foot. So when we're talking about the ASIS, now this is, this is applicable to, to different lines, but I'm including it in this one because it's a nice easy way of explaining it because, it, because the fact that it goes across the body. So it's known as a roadhouse. Now I've just called it a junction. Now the pubic bone is also another one of these. Now this is where many myofascial force vectors meet and or cross. So what it's basically saying is, if you can imagine train tracks, you've probably seen it, and you've got where a lot of train tracks meet, and sometimes a train needs to get from here up to here, so this bit in the middle needs to move from there out to there, so it will rotate itself. So what uh, it's basically saying is where the movement of the leg changes, the junction changes. So if we are sprinting and we are going let's just say in a straight line. Now again, there is mild amounts of rotation when we when we do run, when we do walk, so on and so forth. But just for the purposes of this understanding, we're just gonna say when we're sprinting forward, the, the train tracks or the junction or the roadhouse will flip into this position. So it will go straight up and down to allow that to happen. Then when we come to uh, changing of direction, so going, so running forward and then cutting to the left, what will need to happen if we are going, let's just say, at a 90 degree angle, it will then flip into this position and go across because then it needs to change that direction, if that makes sense. Now, this isn't 100% um, accurate as, a, as an anatomical structure, but metaphorically, it gives us a good way of understanding how the myofascial lines then work and interact each other and it's essentially saying this is the junction between that and when we change direction this is how lines uh, interact with each other so it's not saying that this would be a hundred percent when we're sprinting forward and this is zero and zero it might be that this is uh sorry let's just say this is 50 this is uh uh, 40 and this is 10 if that makes sense and then when we change direction these numbers will change in how the how the myofascial lines interact with each other and how the the roadhouse or the junction interacts with each other so it's very much just a way of understanding the way that the body sort of uh, 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 functions as a whole but we can break it up into to sort of different parts but then put it back together again in this way um, so that is a brief overview of the spiral line. Hopefully it's given you a better understanding not only of the posture and how that, or the postural function of it, the movement function of it, and a very basic understanding of uh, the anatomy and a little bit on uh, the sort of roadhouse junction of the ASIS. So many thanks for watching. My name is Chris from Christopher Hole Training. I will speak to you in a future video.